I was asked when I told my um, friends in London at a conference I was at yesterday that I was coming to Birmingham, I was asked, are you going to be speaking to the Conservative Party conference? <laughs> and I said, no, I don't think so. Um, I'm going to be speaking to a much more open and lively and vigorous audience, um, and one that is less sceptical about certain things. So uh, I'm going to do three things now. One is remind us where we are and how we got here. I understand that most of you, for most of you, this is your first lecture in European law. So I offer you my profound sympathies and, uh, and regrets. Um, but um, uh, I'll try to make it as painless as possible. Um, uh, secondly, to list a number of things which are necessary to be settled before we can do Brexit safely, if we do it. And contrary to um, Professor Tribus, I'm not yet absolutely convinced. Um, and third, I want to make a plea about how we should have the discussion. So our continent at this moment is going through a period of extraordinary turbulence. You know very well that the pressure of migration from the east, the pressure of migration from North Africa, the Trump presidency, the emergence of so-called nativist populist parties in different countries uh, presents Europe, present Europe with an extraordinary set of exceptional, exceptional challenges. So Brexit for the UK is the biggest of those challenges and Brexit presents for the British government and British citizens and British residents the biggest challenge, I guess, since the end of the Second World War to how we're governed, the, the elemental, fundamental questions of how this country uh, shall be governed. Now, Brexit, if it occurs, will represent what an English judge has called a seismic shock, a truly revolutionary change. Now, at times in revolutions, though not so much in the UK, in France, in Germany, in other places, revolutions are associated with bloodshed. Let me just give you a wee bit of reassurance. We go back to 1560, before you were born, and um, in 1560, there occurred in Scotland the Reformation. And the, that was a religious movement, but also a political one. And by an act of um, 1560, the jurisdiction of the Pope was rejected and the saying of the Mass was prohibited. But canon law was retained. Canon law was drafted in Rome and that dealt with um, divorce, wills, uh, relations between parents and children, the relations between husband and wives. And uh, as it was stated, this pontifical law extended to all persons and things relating to the Roman Church. And so deep has this canon law been rooted that even where the Pope's authority is rejected, yet consideration must be given to these laws. In other words, the laws made sense and they were familiar to people and so they were not discarded even though papal jurisdiction was discarded and rejected. Now, um, life muddled through. There was a bit of confusion, um, but life continued and the canon law continued. Now, if Brexit happens, um, uh, it is not the case that mobs of iconoclasts will come into the library and burn all the books with 12 yellow stars and a blue background. It is unlikely that Professor Tribus and myself will be carried out to the nearest lamppost. Violence is not probable, um, but there will be some big changes. Now, I'm speaking in an academic environment. My views are my own. I am a judge. I am not speaking for the court. I'm not speaking for the Daily Mail. I'm sharing academic ideas to a bunch of lively and inquiring minds. Um, that having been said, 
uh, let me emphasize that it's not for judges to make political decisions. We're not paid to decide whether it's a good thing or a bad thing to do a Brexit. Most young people will have a particular view uh, with which perhaps I might personally sympathize. But judges are allowed um, to comment on legal problems which need to be addressed and uh, things which, questions which require proper attention. So I've got these three things I want to address. One is where we are today and why that's relevant to Brexit. As I describe that, I think you'll understand. And let me begin with that. Since January 73, the UK has managed its domestic government in cooperation with its European partners in an increasingly wide range of fields. So originally there were eight partners, today there's 27. Originally it was mainly to do with trade and persons, today it's a vast range. Um, agriculture, animal health, environmental protection, deportation and extradition, equality of remuneration between men and women in the workplace, uh, <clears throat> zoonotic diseases, uh, aviation, hazardous chemicals, um, <clears throat> mutual recognition of judgments, mutual recognition of qualifications, and so on. So the list of areas where the UK cooperates with its continental neighbours is a vast one. And that vast area is consistently underestimated by those who say, let's just do Brexit, let's just leave, as if it were a tennis club and the showers were not clean enough or the, the subscription was too high. It is very, very, very much more complicated than that. Now, Lord Cofield, who was the father of the 1992 program, British commissioner, um, a Thatcherite minister, um, and a revolutionary thinker, he said that sovereignty was like energy. It could change its shape, but it couldn't be destroyed. So he espoused uh, the notion, and he convinced Mrs. Thatcher, who was no easy cookie to convince, um, that Britain's destiny in Europe lay in pulling its sovereignty and using the ability of the civil service and British skill in drafting and common sense to produce standards which would make sense for the European community and then the European Union. So um, today, pre-Brexit, uh, these questions are more and more complicated because life is more and more complicated, um, because the dangers of, uh, for example, food safety. You've read in the news of the poor woman who died because of an allergen. Now, um, these things are extremely serious. Uh, they can be matters <coughs> of life and death. So how are these standards set? Well. Um, let's assume that we're talking about something for animal feed. Uh, there are many products which are given to animals to keep them healthy and to ensure that they prosper um, and that the farmers can make money out of selling them for consumption. Um, a new product is discovered. Is that a good one? Is it safe? Is it efficacious? Same for pharmaceuticals. The pharmaceutical industry is constantly looking for new products. Um, the European Medicines Agency is one of about 35 agencies which are scattered all over the European Union and those agencies participate in the elaboration of new standards. And so those agencies are staffed by permanent officials and by experts from the member states. So the best veterinary medicine person or the best epidemiology person, or the best antibiotic uh, research person from Estonia comes to meet 
his or her colleagues in uh, London, if it's medicines, uh, to discuss a new candidate to be approved <coughs> as the new antibiotic. Now, um, because of geography, cooperation is essential. That's to say, we can't, uh, well, it wouldn't be convenient to have a world where s one standard applied in the UK and another standard applied in the 27. Technically feasible, but not very convenient. For example, supposing the pesticide glyphosate, which is called Roundup, um, were deemed to be unacceptable in the 27, but acceptable in the UK, a, a possible outcome, if there are two different standards. Um, a British farmer who used that herbicide would discover that the farmer would not be able to export her crops um, to or, or meat uh, to the 27. Um, so there is an evident linkage between the UK and the 27. So uh, the agencies who elaborate new standards are in constant uh, flux as to the, 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 the products which they approve. Now, you're saying to yourself maybe, why is this so important? It's because daily life is governed by many, many, many standards. When you go into um, the butchers, when you go into a supermarket, when you go into a restaurant, when you get into a car, when you wear a judo suit um, for um, a judo competition, uh, you are governed or you use or you rely upon the existence of standards which guarantee or should guarantee the quality of the product which you purchase or use or consume. Um, the, the, um, the range can be, the range of topics can be very, very large. Um, and I can offer you two, three examples. One um, is a bathroom tile uh, made by DuPont, a filled plastic or an artificial stone. For customers' purposes, it means two and a half percent of customs duty difference. Um, is a phthalate, which is a plastic plasticizer that softens toys to be chewed by babies. Are phthalates dangerous or neutral? Should they be prohibited? Should they be permitted? Now, there are dozens and dozens and dozens of standards, dozens of ongoing questions and controversies about these matters. Now, regulation is an ongoing process. Science and industry, we're in the chemistry theatre, uh, science and industry keep discovering new things. And of course they should. Um, so what to do about, let's assume that Brexit occurs, contrary to my wishes, um, that's an unjudicial statement, um, <laughs> but with which I suspect a fair number of you might sympathise, um, uh, Brexit occurs. Now, how is the UK to deal with the necessity of extensive legislation and regulation while respecting the concerns of those who feel Brussels is interfering and, and um, obtrusive? Hmm? Now, the proposal is, uh, it, it is estimated, I haven't done it, but the BBC has done, that there are 90,000 nine zero and three zeros, 90,000 texts which constitute the corpus of European law today. And uh, some of these are trivial, some are important, some may have been repealed, but there's a, think of that as a, uh, as a mass of wires uh, with yellow stars and a blue background. Now, the, the UK solution to the problem of wishing for reasons of sovereignty to leave the European Union, the British solution is to take this bundle of wires, uh, those are my words, my analogy, and <coughs> plonk them into a bath of Britishness, which uh, this bath has got the Union Jack on it, the British flag, and 
uh, those texts will become identically worded to the European texts, but they will have been adopted by a UK minister. And so that solves, or, or may contribute to solving, the sovereignty problem. Now, the goal of the communings between experts and technical agencies scattered all over Europe um, and member state governments and lobbyists and scientists, the goal of these communings is to produce um, a Europe which is safe, which is prosperous, which rewards innovation and which doesn't completely eliminate risk but which makes sensible choices where there has to be a balance. Now, um, as part of the um, withdrawal of the withdrawal arrangements, as I said, the idea is that the tens of thousands of European texts be rebranded, but not reworded, as UK texts. So the farmer, the doctor, the pharmacist, the engineer, um, the owner of grassland uh, will be governed after Brexit as before Brexit by the same set of technical norms. But technical regulation continues. So the day after Brexit, a new product emerges. Where and the new product is going to be has to be approved because we can't imagine that, uh, that um, food or animal feed would be uh, dosed with a new unknown product which has not been tested. How shall the United Kingdom's experts and the 27 experts cooperate? Big question. The current version of the proposal is that there would be what's delicately called a common rule book. What does a common rule book mean? We don't at the moment know, but it probably means that um, the same standards would apply on both sides of the English Channel. So the UK will have three choices. One will be set up a UK agency which will decide for the UK pharmaceutical, animal health, uh, chemical, environmental standards, which might be different to those of the 27, but if they're different to the 27, then the benefits of the European market are lost. Or not regulate, probably unlikely, or simply follow the standards set by the EU 27 without having a technical or political influence on the drafting of those standards. Um, now, um, <clears throat> as of, yeah, so I repeat, one of the great challenges which will be permanent for as long as there is a bath of identically worded in origin, legal texts governing technical regulation of our daily life. But this one, the European one, is changing because of technical progress, but this one isn't. For so long as that phenomenon persists, there will be uncertainty. Now, that presents the possibility of considerable constitutional uh, conflict. Now, um, let's pass on to the issue of judicial review. You're starting your careers in law, my sympathies, but it is an interesting time. Um, one of the topics that you will study, and which is extremely interesting, which I've done a lot of, is judicial review. Two big different principles. Um, your neighbour has encroached on your land and you say that your neighbour is building a wall on part of your property. You're walking in the street, you're knocked down and you say the person who knocked you down uh, was driving negligently. 
that person says that you were being careless. Now, that's a civil law contest or disagreement between two people, which goes to the civil courts. Um, separately is the question of judicial review. You are in dispute with the government. You're in dispute with the state. And judicial review is the mechanism by which the validity of what the state is, has done is examined and tested before a judge. Now, judges in every country, including the United Kingdom, are usually conservative animals with a small c, and they are hesitant to say that the government has misregulated. So if it's a matter which is within the competence of the regulator, for example, whether a disabled child is sufficiently disabled to merit a free bus pass, very rare will it be that a judge says the, the, the official who made that determination got it wrong. The official had regard to all the relevant circumstances. I'm not going to go behind that. But there are situations, and there will be situations, where judicial review uh, may be granted, and that's one of the big um, areas where new rulemaking uh, presents um, uh, doctrines established by European law for examining the legality of uh, administrative action. So one of the doctrines of European law, I can see glazed eyes, but it's actually interesting, so stay with me. Uh, stay awake, just hold on for a second. Um, proportionality is the notion that the public authority should not inflict upon the individual burdens which are disproportionate to the importance of the goal. So establishing the death penalty for parking beyond 60 minutes would be disproportionate. It would be other things as well, but we'd all agree that it would be disproportionate. Now, there's a number of doctrines of European law which have been established by the European courts and others in order to assist, in order to give standards, criteria for um, the determination of challenges to European legal texts. Now, this gets tricky. Um, remember the bath of UK law, but it's all European texts originally, and here are the European texts, the original European texts. One of these rules is challenged as being contrary to European law. Is it acceptable for the litigant to say that text is invalid because it infringes the principles governing the European law from which it was copied? And that issue is bouncing around at the moment and it may, uh, it may be the case that the UK will forbid the invocation or uh, exclude, which is slightly different, the invocation of EU legal principles to challenge the terms of the enforcement of the UK labelled legal principles in this bath. Strange? Curious? Am I being understood? A few nods. Okay, let's, let's, let's deem that to be unanimous. Um, so, judges have to make sense of these controversies. Question, what weight should be given by a British judge in a domestic court healing, hearing a challenge to the validity of a European uh, rule which has been Britishized. So one possibility is that the British judge could be expected to pursue consistency with the acquis communautaire, that's to say the, the, the corpus of European legal principle by which we have been governed for the past 45 years. Consistency is a good thing, isn't it, surely? No, might be the answer. Consistency is not a good thing. 
because we've decided to leave the European Union. And therefore, non-consistency is just as good as consistency. The British judge should make an independent determination without having regard to consistency. Um, what about um, health, customs, safety, all those, um, all those questions? Do we want different norms in the UK than apply in the European Union? Uh, again, what weight to give uh, to consistency? So, um, it's... Um, I offer another example with a personal uh, touch to it. Um, as you heard, uh, when I was a student in the United States, uh, I, and after that, I sat the New York bar exam. And I passed the New York bar exam, which is a grisly experience, but it's nicer to pass than to fail. Um, and after that, I thought, OK, it's a downhill slope. Um, I'm um, going to be a member of the New York bar. But the character committee of the New York bar said Forrester is a non-resident alien and we're not going to admit him to the bar. Among other reasons, because there's a number of American lawyers, American citizens, who are looking for a job in New York and if we let foreigners in, especially those who are non-resident aliens, that'll make life more difficult for uh, American citizens. Now supposing that uh, one of you is a national of uh, another member state and you're a candidate to, you say, I've studied in Spain, my, I've got equivalent qualifications, uh, I wish to become an architect in Scotland, so admit me. Is the Scottish administration entitled to say, well, we're going to give preference to Scots? where you have a Spanish qualification and that's fine, but we don't really need more architects in Scotland. Um, and uh, if we do need more architects in Scotland, we're not going to give advantages to uh, a Spanish qualified architect. Now those questions uh, will pop up, will pop up, will arise, uh, and it will be up to the courts to decide what shall be the criteria for determining those um, controversies. And that will be a big and sensitive area of, um, <clears throat> of um, judicial policy. And there, I hope very much that Her Majesty's government will give to judges the guidance which is appropriate, saying do or don't accord importance to consistency with EU 27 um, because it would be, I suggest, unfair to British judges to blame them for pursuing a judicial policy, uh, a judicial practice which uh, endorses the principle of consistency through, through the European Union or rejects the idea of consistency through the European Union, uh, throughout the European Union. These are political matters as to which um, judges deserve some guidance. So this is the end of the first point I want to make. Um, and here are a few conclusions. First, for as long as the provisions of European law are to be applied in the UK, for so long will it be necessary essential to give proper thought to how contentious issues will be litigated. Second, it's not by nationalizing EU regulations and rebranding them as British that problems of interpretation will be solved. Um, the current criteria for determining those controversies are terribly complicated and I hope that they will be improved. And finally, um, I was accused after a report uh, of a <coughs> talk that I gave of being in the press of being a pompous um, traitor and I said, I know about the pompous but the traitor is a bit surprising. Um, so. 
we shouldn't accuse judges whose decisions aren't pro or anti EU or pro or anti UK or pro or anti UKIP or pro or anti Labour. We shouldn't accuse judges who have the job of making sense of texts <coughs> of having a lack of patriotism if they do their best to make sense of an extremely entangled situation. Okay, now, my next topic is what needs to be taken account of before a Brexit can safely occur. And I could go on for two, three hours, but let me just um, cut it to the bone and do it in two and a half hours. Um, <laughs> the first one is crime policing and security. I give you a recent example <coughs> about um, not this year, last. Um, a murder is committed in Glasgow. A young woman is attacked in a park um, in, um, in Glasgow and horribly uh, assaulted and murdered. The um, police come, they discover the body, they make inquiries and the suspect is rapidly identified. The suspect has skipped town and has gone, as it happens, to Slovakia, uh, wh of which he is a national. Uh, Slovakia does not deport normally its own citizens, does not extradite uh, its own citizens. Um, but because of the European arrest warrant, uh, the suspect was within a day or two uh, on the request of the Scottish police and uh, um, the Lord Advocate, the, the head of the prosecution service in Scotland, uh, the person was arrested and he was sent back to Scotland where he stood trial, was convicted and sentenced to prison. That was done on the basis of cooperation between police and that's under a framework at the top of which <coughs> is European Union law. You can't do extradition on the basis of a back of an envelope. You can't do extradition on the basis that I know that policeman, he's a good guy, uh, this person looks like a rogue, let's, uh, let's ship him off. That is no acceptable basis in a society of law for extradition, for arrest. Um, <clears throat> now, that's, that's, one, um, that's one, ex one judicial example. Another one, constantly, um, the UK police use um, a, a database uh, to check on uh, criminality and the identity of individuals. So a, a Latvian burglar is, a, a suspected burglar is arrested and um, there's something like a, a million hits a year. It's an enormous number of occasions on which the British police and other police forces exchange information on uh, criminal enforcement matters. Um, air transport. Uh, Flights between the UK and the United States used to be governed by bilateral deals so that British Airways, an example, could fly to Washington in exchange for United being able to fly from Los Angeles to Glasgow, say. Um, that would be a bit of a stretch, but um, you, you, you see the idea. It used to be bilateral cooperation between countries. Now, aviation is governed by European um, bloc. The 28 countries have done a deal with, for example, the United States. It's not only with respect to routes, but it's also with respect to the qualifications uh, of, of pilots. So um, it's not that there is no solution. There, there, there can be, there would be solutions, but the matter needs to be uh, addressed. Um, you can hear from my accent as I move to another subject that I come from Scotland. And uh, the third most important economic activity in Scotland is the production of Scotch whisky. Now, um, the UK, with respect to um, denominations of origin for food and drink uses, used the doctrine of passing off. That's to say 
the maker of an Arbroath, the producer of an Arbroath Smoky, or a Lochfein Kipper, um, or Scotch whisky, could say to a rival in Newcastle, you're selling your fish or your whisky, uh, pretending that it is authentic Scotch whisky, pretending that it's authentic Arbroath Smokies, and that's not true. Now, that was the UK method. The continental method is much more rigorous, and it is based on appellations of origin, and so um, appellations of quality. So that means that Brie, Camembert, uh, Chianti, um, are <coughs> Grappa, are all defined Parma ham. It uh, has to be prepared in a certain way, and it has to be sliced in Parma. Um, feta cheese. Um, now, that is fundamentally opposed. Uh, that, that approach contradicts the American approach, which used to be Wisconsin cheddar or California Chablis. And um, champagne, there is a drink which used to be called Baby Sham. I don't know if it's still available in the, in the bar, but I suspect not. And it was suppressed because Baby Sham implies that it's connected with champagne. Now, uh, the importance for the Scotch whisky industry and other producers of food and drinks uh, cannot be overstated. Um, and uh, it's highly desirable that Brexit not happen until a regime is in place whereby those producers are, uh, for the future, adequately uh, protected. Then, um, uh, customs. Understand that under, you've heard probably on the, on the news, uh, let's adopt WTO rules. Now the WTO, formerly the GATT, has the regime that a country which signs, or a group of countries, which signs the GATT, or the WTO, World Trade Organization, makes a promise. My country will levy 5% on tennis balls from anywhere in the world, from a GATT signatory, from a WTO signatory. And in exchange, New Zealand, say, says, my country, in exchange for that promise, my country will levy 2% on golf balls and 1% on butter. Um, so each country or group of countries that is party to the WTO commits itself multilaterally to treat everyone the same, no distinction between countries who are exporting to your territory, in exchange for promising what that country will do going forward. Now, WTO rules don't eliminate customs formalities between countries. So just to be clear, if we're talking of zero tariffs for the UK and respect for WTO rules, that would mean that the UK charges no tariffs on imports, which is free to do, but when it exports or UK exporters ship to France, they would be subject to the common customs tariff, which is somewhere between 5 and 10% um, uh, uh, and is consistently applied by the 27 member states. Um, then persons. There are something like 4 million people, including two of my sons, who are dependent on, and each of you, or each of you who is a citizen of the EU, of, of the UK, you have grown up in a world where it is as normal to go and move to Thessaloniki or to Salzburg or to Berlin as it is to go to Inverness or Exeter. Now, the rules concerning the rights of Brits abroad and the rights of EU 27 in the UK are extremely complicated and extremely sensitive. I have, li <coughs> I have lived as an alien in a foreign country. And dealing with public authority, having the right to reside, is very different to having the right to ask to reside. Um, 
These are real burdens, and they are worse for the poor, the least educated, and the most disadvantaged in society. Now, this is not the place to describe in great detail the problems being debated, and those problems have perhaps become worse because of the Windrush uh, dramas uh, and scandals. But they should not be underestimated. Uh, next example, driving license. Next example, um, equivalence of qualifications. You're all students, you're all brilliant, you all want to do well, you all want to get a degree, and you all want to have freedom of movement. Now what, what recognition will be given to your law degree when you leave this university? And will that entitle you to practice your profession uh, in, um, in other countries? We don't know. At the moment, uh, someone who is admitted to the bar in England is entitled to present themselves to earn their living as an English barrister in Brussels or um, uh, in any other um, member state. And there are thousands and thousands of young lawyers and older lawyers who have relied on that practice, that phenomenon, that legal entitlement to pursue their careers, including myself. So I have listed very high level, very rapidly, um, a dozen examples, maybe not, maybe it's only eight, but a bunch of examples where my contention is that it's dangerous for Brexit or undesirable for Brexit to go ahead without those things having been properly thought through. Or if Brexit politically goes ahead, we need a transitional period during which these matters can be properly and seriously addressed. Um, and my last point, and I can see a sigh of relief going up, um, I will stop. Uh, my last point is a plea for moderation. Um, nationality is not a reliable basis for determining, determining ethnicity or affiliation. The, the drivers of human movement, the refugees from the Ukraine, the refugees from North Africa, um, the dramas that have afflicted Europe over centuries um, don't correspond uh, to the political frontiers of countries today. If you look at maps of Europe going back to um, uh, 1648 and the Treaty of Westphalia, you will see that Poland gets bigger, shrinks, shrinks, disappears, and then is re-established. You'll see that Serbia disappears and is re-established. You'll see that Finland, Sweden, Norway, their frontiers move uh, in, in function of political pressures. So it is not the case that nationality, loyalty, ethnicity, patriotism match political frontiers. Nelson's ships at Trafalgar, sorry if there's any French people here, um, had 28 nationalities aboard. Now, the European Union um, has a number of real achievements which I think can't sensibly be denied. One is the, eliminating of, the elimination of military rivalry in Western Europe. Another is the bringing down or contributing to the bringing down of um, the Berlin Wall and the liberation, as they see it, um, of hundreds of millions of people in Eastern Europe from um, Soviet rule. Now, those achievements are enormous. And um, Europe today, I think, is unique in the world in that almost a continent of states have agreed with each other that they will treat men and women in the workplace equally, that they will give opportunity of access to health care, that they will give equal pensions to men and women, that they will accord decent conditions of employment, decent protection, consistent protection of the environment, and 
in other ways, good, reasonable, consensually agreed standards for how we live our daily lives. And that there will also be a respect for democratic values. And they have agreed with respect not just to their own citizens, but to the citizens of all the other member states. That is a unique European achievement. Now, there's, I suggest, a great burden upon the negotiators to deliver a result that respects Europe's values. Um, the UK Civil Service, the staff of the European Commission, are extremely talented, exceptionally gifted, but their tasks are enormous. And I suggest that there's a duty upon commentators, bloggers, teachers, students, um, anyone who is articulate uh, to avoid the temptation to mock, to exaggerate or to condemn on the basis of opinions which are not shared. The seriousness of the challenge is such that it deserves better. It's unhelpful to say just leave as if Brexit was like leaving the tennis club. The question is far, far more delicate. And so, given these difficult circumstances, winning should not be the goal. We should have learned from now that history teaches us that bad treaties and unrealistic treaties may not survive conflict and may not survive, I should say, crisis. So my last remark to you is let us calm down, let us breathe deeply, let us reproach zealots, and let us pursue and encourage sensible discourse with respect to Brexit. Thank you for your attention. <coughs>